Hey guys, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about chapter one, which is the introduction for this course, Biology 1406. We are using Campbell's Biology and Focus. Um, the addition doesn't really matter because it's going to have the same content, right? Cells are still the basic unit of life, no matter which version of the textbook you're using. Um, but we're using this particular version with this little um, owl on the front. And um, we are going to go through the basic just introduction, the main themes of biology in this chapter. It kind of covers everything very briefly. So in my class, this will just be as an introduction. We're not going to have any assignments or anything over this, just to expose you to biology. So welcome to the world of biology. Let's talk about it. Okay, so inquiring about life. We know that biology is the study of life. So an organism's adaptations to its environment are a result of evolution. Now, evolution is something that absolutely dictates the life that we see today and the life that we've seen in history, right? So evolution is the main overarching theme that we're going to talk about throughout all of biology, connecting everything that we learn back to evolution. And that's where we're starting off with that. So for example, there's two different types of mice. There's a beach mouse. Um, it has light and dappled fur that acts as camouflage. If it's camouflage, it means it blends into its environment. It's going to avoid, avoid uh, predation. If it's not being eaten, then it's going to live, it's going to have babies, and it's going to contribute to the gene pool for the next generation. That is the dream for evolution, right? Whereas we have these inland mice that have, um, it's the same species, but they have darker um, fur, which is going to help them match their specific surroundings. Again, avoiding predation, surviving, having offspring, contributing to the gene pool of the next generation. That is the goal of evolution. That means that these animals are suited to their environment. And that is basically all of biology is focusing on that main goal, living, right? It's a study of life, not dead things. So evolution is a process of change that's transformed life on earth. Again, biology, study of life. This is how evolution is helping to impact all of that. It's changes in our life forms on earth. So biology, scientific study of life, it um, works to try to answer questions like this. Um, how does a cell develop into an organism? How does the human mind work? How do different forms of life in a forest interact? These are all questions that can be addressed through biology. Um, so the first concept we're going to talk about is studying the diverse life forms. Um, forms of life reveal common themes. Like I said, these themes are basically what you're going to see again and again and again, no matter what topic of biology we're talking about. So like the first one I was talking about is evolution, of course. So to organize and make sense of all of the information encountered in biology, we're going to focus on a few big ideas. And these are the main themes or the central themes of biology. So these unifying themes help us to organize biological information. There is so much information about life. There's a class in college and graduate school for each specific little branch of biology. And this class is just an introduction to the main ideas of each of those branches. You can go as far as you want into any of those avenues. Um, so this theme we're gonna talk about is um, new properties emerge at successive levels of biological organization. So life is actually studied at different levels. You can study it all the way from atoms all the way to the biosphere. Um, this textbook uses molecules as the smallest organization, but it's fine no matter what your textbook is. It's either going to be atoms or molecules as our smallest hierarchy level. So uh, life can be studied at different levels from molecules to the entire living planet, which is our biosphere. We live on planet Earth today in 2020. Um, the study of life can be divided into different levels of biological organization, which I have a picture for on the next slide. And in reductionism, complex systems are reduced to simpler components to make them more manageable to study. Because like I said, if you're trying to go through and study everything that you possibly can about biology, you'd have to spend your entire life doing it because there's so much detail of each of the branches of biology. So reductionism is kind of what like a textbook or this kind of course would practice. We're reducing the details to kind of give you an overview of all of the different branches to see what you might be interested in. So here are those um, levels of organization that we were talking about. So the largest one is going to be our biosphere, our planet. Then we have ecosystems, communities, populations. Of course, this is large going very, very small all the way to the end at molecules. Again, below molecules, you might have atoms, right? So you know that your cell is the basic unit of life. So a cell is made of organelles. Organelles are made of molecules. Mole molecules are made of atoms, right? That's kind of how you would read a, a uh, graphic like this. Structure and function. This is one of my favorite themes of biology. Um, I'm going to say this 550 billion times to my kids. Structure dictates function. So the way that something is shaped is going to determine what it does. 
And I'm going to say that 150 billion times because it is so vital for understanding biology. Things just weren't oddly shaped because someone has a divine sense of humor, right? They're shaped that way because of the job that they were built to do, which is very simple and honestly amazing how all these little moving parts work together because of their shapes. So at each level of biological hierarchy, we find a correlation between the structure and the function because the way something is shaped gives you a clue as to what it does. So analyzing a biological structure, the way it looks, can give you clues about what it does and how it works, right? Two things that are gonna interact together are obviously going to have to be shaped that they would look like they could go together, almost like little puzzle pieces. Okay, so the cell is a basic unit of life. So an organism's basic unit of structure and function. This is again, one of those quote themes that a cell is the basic unit of life. So the cell is kind of the definition of everything that a living organism has to have in order to be considered alive. So a cell is the smallest unit of life that can perform all the required activities of life. And again, depending on your textbook, if there's anywhere from six to like 12 um, characteristics of life. Um, our textbook uses a, a smaller number, but basically all cells share these certain characteristics as defined by your textbook. Um, one of them is being enclosed by a membrane. Every single cell has a cellular membrane. Think about a water balloon. You couldn't have a water balloon if you didn't have the balloon. You would just have a handful of water, right? You have to have something that encloses the water or the cytoplasm and all of the organelles in a cell, right? So every single cell, the basic unit of life, has a cellular membrane. That is one of our characteristics of life, okay? Um, the two main forms of cells that we know about so far are prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. So we're going to talk about the similarities and differences between those. Okay, so a eukaryotic cell. Eukaryotic. You have eukaryotic cells. It literally has you in this pronunciation there, okay? A eukaryotic cell contains membrane-enclosed or membrane-bound organelles. This means that these organelles have a membrane around the outside of them, um, including our DNA containing nucleus. Now, a nucleus is a characteristic of a eukaryotic cell. So all eukaryotic cells have a nucleus that contains DNA. That is a defining characteristic of a eukaryotic cell. These membrane-bound organelles, I'm going to give you an example of a refrigerator, right? Your refrigerator, on the inside of it, let's say you have leftovers. Hopefully, you're not disgusting and put your leftovers just like straight on the shelf. Hopefully, you put them in like a container, maybe a bag, maybe a, like a, a Tupperware container, maybe the takeout container that you ordered your Chinese food in, you just leave that in it. But everything is in a container. It's all enclosed. Your orange juice sits next to your milk, but they're not mixing because they are enclosed in a membrane called a bottle. Well, your organelles are the same way in eukaryotic cells. They are all contained in their own little membranes. That way, none of them touch and mix, just like your refrigerator. Um, some organelles, such as the chloroplast, are limited to certain cell types, like plants, because that's how they make their food, and uh, they carry out photosynthesis. Okay, um, in our prokaryotic cells, our second type of cells, prokaryotic cells are bacteria cells. Um, they lack a nucleus. This means that they do not have a nucleus or other membrane bound organelles. And they're generally a whole lot smaller because they have a lot less on the inside of them than a eukaryotic cell. So I have an acronym um, for prokaryotic cells to help you remember. It's P, B, no, no, P, B, no, no. Prokaryotic, bacteria, no nucleus, no membrane-bound organelles. So you would never find a nucleus in a prokaryotic cell. That's the first no, no nucleus. All prokaryotic cells are bacteria. That's the B, right? No membrane-bound organelles, because where would you find those? You would find those in a eukaryotic cell. So there's only two types of cells, eukaryotic and prokaryotic. Prokaryotic PB, no, no. Prokaryotic are bacteria. And then with our eukaryotic, those are our plants, animals, and fungi. Okay, so here's a size comparison for you. So we have our eukaryotic cell is this large cell with the big purple circle in the middle. And then we have our little tiny prokaryotic cell. It's kind of like a little oval. It's like a little pill shape. Okay, they, they're called rods. It's called a bacillus shape. 
Um, so the eukaryotic cell is very large, and you notice all these different little globular structures on the inside, right? Those are all the membrane-bound organelles. And that giant purple dot in the middle is the nucleus, which, of course, holds the DNA. It's the control center of the whole cell. And then in our prokaryotic cell, we still have DNA, absolutely. You have to have DNA to be alive, but it's just not inside of a nucleus, and that's okay. It's just kind of floating around in the cytoplasm. And then we also might have... Um, ribosomes because ribosomes are not membrane bound organelles um, but then other than that there's not a whole lot going on inside of our prokaryotic cells but notice that they both have a cell membrane and they both have dna because those are two of the characteristics of life okay our next theme here so life's uh, um, life's processes involve expression and transmission of genetic information this is that dna that i was just telling you about right dna is deoxyribonucleic acid it is the basic like blueprint that makes you, you, makes your dog, your dog, makes grass look like grass, right? Every single thing that is alive contains its specific DNA that is unique to itself, unless you're like a special unicorn child that is a identical twin, which is really, really cool. But we're just, for the intents and purposes, gonna say that DNA makes everything different, right? It's a blueprint to create each individual human, each individual dog, blade of grass, all of that, okay? So the chromosomes contain um, contain most of the cell's genetic information in DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, um, you can see these little blue guys here are chromosomes, and they are being separated. This is the process of cellular division, but the little blue guys there are chromosomes, which are made of DNA. Pretty cool. Okay, so DNA, structure, and function. Remember, structure dictates function. This is important, right? Main theme. The DNA molecule holds hundreds or thousands of genes. So genes are just segments of DNA that end up coding for a protein. And each stretch of DNA um, along a chromosome is gonna hold various amounts of genes, right? A gene is a unit of inheritance that transmits information from the parents to the offspring. So you're kind of a little blend of your parents. That's what made you, right? You are a mix of mother and father DNA to create you as an offspring. Um, as cells grow and divide, the genetic information encoded by DNA helps to direct the development. It's the blueprint, it's the directions, it's the design scheme to make you. So you started off once upon a time, it was when a sperm and an egg came together as a fertilized egg, that is called a zygote. That was the first cell to make you. And now you are trillions of cells and DNA is responsible for making all of that happen. It carries all of the directions. Here's what I was talking about. So once upon a time when two people fell in love and were married and financially stable and old enough to produce offspring, um, there was a sperm cell and an egg cell that came together to create a fertilized egg called a zygote. So this contains DNA from both parents and that developed into an embryo. And that embryo eventually turned into a fetus which was born and then you have this little baby offspring, a tiny, tiny human and that's what happened to each one of us and why we're alive today, right? So you are a blend of DNA that came from a man and a woman who came together, like I said, married in love, financially stable, old enough, all of that, right? To have you as a, you know, little tiny offspring that is just a little mix, a little blend of all of their DNA. Okay, um, a DNA molecule is made of two long chains, two chains, I'm arranged in a double helix. So I like to think DNA, DNA, double chain, double helix. Match up all the Ds, right? DNA, double chain, double helix. It is like two spirals on your little notebook, but two of them, right? That, that are all little spirals together. Helix is a little spiral, okay? And then each, um, each link of a chain is one of four kinds of chemical uh, building blocks that are actually called nucleotides. A nucleotide is a monomer or one piece of a DNA molecule. And they are abbreviated A, T, C, and G. And you probably learned this freshman year, high school, where they teach you apples grow on trees, gas goes in cars. So A and T will always be paired together and C and G will always be paired together. And that'll make sense in a minute, if you don't remember. So here we go. DNA is a double-stranded molecule and it is a double helix. So in this image here, you can see the double helix. It's like two little of your little spirals on your notebook together. And over here, you can see one half, right? 
you have A, C, T, A. This order of all these nucleotides, right? Because we just learned that those are called nucleotides. A, T, C, and G are called nucleotides. Those are actually our nitrogenous bases, but they're part of nucleotides. Okay, it's actually got three pieces. It's a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base that makes up a nucleotide here. But this is only half. This is a single strand. And is DNA a single strand? No, it's got to match up all the Ds. It's a double strand. Okay, so if you know that an A is here, what should go next to it? Apples grow on trees. So it should be paired up with a T on the second strand, right? A C, gas goes in cars. G, gas would go here. So you would have T, G, A, T, A, T, right? Okay, that's how that would go. So you can tell from one side what the other side is actually going to look like. This is the whole structure dictates function. If you only know half the structure, you can figure out the other half because the function is to zip up and create this double strain to helix. That's pretty cool. Okay, so DNA provides the blueprints for making proteins, the major players in building and maintaining a cell. So we know that DNA is made of chromosomes which carry genes and genes give directions for making proteins. Now proteins, are wonderful um, macromolecules, larger molecules that are either structural or enzymatic. So they either help to build you or help to do a process within your cells and in your body. So um, genes control protein production indirectly using RNA as an intermediary. So basically DNA has to be copied into RNA, which can then go make a protein. That's the central dogma of biology. DNA to RNA to protein is the central dogma of how information is transferred um, around your cells. So gene expression is a process of converting information from gene to a cellular product. And we learn about that in like chapters like 14 and 15. Gene expression is actually pretty interesting. Okay, so genomics, we're talking about DNA, we're talking about your inheritance, we're talking about genes, genomics. Sounds kind of like genes at the beginning because it has to do with your genes. So we can do large scale analysis of DNA sequences um, going through genomics and incorporating some technology. So an organism's genome is all of the sets of genetic information. So their whole entire DNA strand, which is huge, right? It's, it's hundreds of thousands of bases long. Um, and the human genome uh, and the genomes of many other organisms have already actually been sequenced um, through DNA sequencing machines. So essentially you get a sample from an organism, you send it into a specific DNA sequencing machine, and after several reactions take place, it'll tell you A, T, G, C, C, A, A, C, G, C, G. It tells you every single one of those little nitrogenous bases in the order to make that person. It's giving you the directions to make them, the blueprint, that's really interesting. So we've sequenced quite a few different organisms. Um, and genomics is a study of sets of genes within and between species. So once we have the sequences, all of those little letters read out, we can see like, oh, between humans and chimpanzees, there's quite a few regions that have the same letters. Well, that means that we are expressing the same proteins. And that is a hint that we were along the evolutionary line somewhere, somehow related right? That helps us prove all of that. Again, this is how evolution comes in because this is an overarching theme of biology. Um, you have the high throughput technology that refers to tools that can analyze biological material very rapidly. Um, we won't be working with any of that specifically, but we'll talk about a few of the processes when we get to biotechnology. Um, bioinformatics is uh, the use of computational tools, so computers, to store, organize, and analyze high volume of data. High volume of data would be like, you know, sequencing DNA that we just talked about. Uh, you also have interdisciplinary research teams that um, aim to learn how activities of all proteins and non-coding RNAs are coordinated in cells and the whole organism. So you have all these different organisms on the planet that produce proteins, and proteins help them to accomplish tasks like digestion and just moving things around the cells, things like that. Um, and then you also have non-coding regions of, of this RNA, which has a purpose, but if it's non-coding, you're like, yeah, but why do we need it? We don't know why we need it, but we know that if you take it out of an organism, it does horrible things to them. So we know that we need it, even though it doesn't code for anything. So we're trying to figure out what it does it's called junk RNA. That's a huge topic of uh, research right now. Um, so we can use the uh, incorporation of biology with technology to help us kind of like answer some of these questions as we're going further and further along, you know, the uh, technology 
um, you know, growth era that we are in currently. Our next theme here is going to be that life requires the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. So we have the input of energy mainly from the sun. You know that that's the main source of energy for our uh, planet. It's going to go through a transformation of energy from one form to another to make life possible. You know that you have plants that go through photosynthesis that absorb sunlight, convert it to chemical energy. You have organisms that are going to eat those plants and so on. That's the food chain, right? So plants and other photosynthetic organisms convert energy from the sunlight called solar energy into chemical energy in uh, sugars called glucose. Right, and this chemical energy um, of these producers is then passed on to consumers that feed on them. For example, sunlight gives this energy to grass, grass makes glucose, cow eats the grass, human eats the cow, it is the food chain, right? That's how energy is transformed from one life form to the other. So energy flows through an ecosystem. Okay, so generally entering as light and exiting as heat. Um, whenever we lose energy, it's always dissipating as heat. Um, because as you're moving around and everything, you're generating heat. Well, you're also using energy from the foods that you're eating. This is still all part of that energy flow. Um, chemical elements are recycled within an ecosystem. These are going to be more of like the um, nitrogen cycle and things like that. So here's a picture to kind of illustrate some of this. We have light energy that comes into our plants that photosynthesize, and then we have consumers that are going to eat those plants. You'll also see that we have some decomposers here that are gonna be returning some nutrients back into the soil. You'll also learn a little bit about the water cycle and things like that, all of these different cycles that are going to help materials get recycled or flow through an ecosystem in order to make life possible. Our next theme, organisms interact with other organisms and the physical environment. So this is a study of um, ecology. So basically how organisms interact with each other and how they interact with their environment. So every organism interacts with physical factors in its environment. Um, both organisms and their environments are affected by the interactions between them. So we have biotic and abiotic factors. These are words you should be familiar with. So biotic is something that is alive. So for instance, we have animals and we have um, fungi, we have plants. These are all living factors of an ecosystem. Abiotic would be not living, right? These are things like um, sun, not living, but we need it. Water, not living, but we need it, right? Wind, things like that. Um, things like rocks that are gonna provide shelter, things like that. So for example, um, a tree takes up water and minerals from the soil and carbon dioxide from the air, and then the tree releases oxygen into the air and the roots um, help to form soil. So interactions between organisms include those that benefit both organisms and those in which both organisms are harmed. Um, so typically there's three different types of relationships that we study. We study parasitism, which is when you have a parasite, so one is benefiting, the other is being harmed. We have mutualism, where both organisms are benefiting. And then we also have commensalism, which is a little harder to understand, but it's where <coughs> one organism is benefiting and the other organism is neither helped nor harmed. It's just kind of like, meh, okay, thanks, I'm here. You're not really bothering me, but if you're getting a benefit, cool deal. All right, those are the three types of interactions that exist between organisms. And we have interactions that affect individual organisms um, and the way the populations evolve over time. This has to do with mating and competition for resources and things like that. Um, so evolution, we're finally get to talk more about this. So evolution is the core theme of biology. As I said, every single thing that you learn about biology, so life in general, can be related back to biology somehow. Um, and related back to evolution somehow, obviously. So evolution makes sense of everything we know about living things. So the whole study of biology can be linked back to evolution. So evolution explains patterns of unity and diversity in living organisms. So we know that there are, unity and diversity sound like two different terms, right? They're like oppositions a little bit. Unity, that we have similar proteins that we were talking about. We have the same four components of DNA, A, T, C, and G that make up every single thing that's alive. And diversity, there are trillions of different organisms on our planet. So we have characteristics in common, but also we have a very diverse um, life base on our planet. Uh, similar traits among organisms are explained by descent from common ancestors. This is called descent with modification which is Darwin's theory of evolution through natural selection. Um, and then there are differences among organisms that are explained by the accumulation of heritable changes. 
So these are things that are being passed down from one generation to the next based on that particular organism's adaptations and genes that make them best suited for their environment. So the core theme, evolution accounts for the unity and diversity of life. We just talked about those two terms a little bit and how they come into play, even though they seem like they're um, opposing. And the remarkably diverse forms of life on this planet arose by evolutionary process. Now, evolution is actually the last thing that we will talk about in this course because we're slowly building up towards that. Because remember, everything in biology has to do with evolution, right? Evolution is the driving change, the driving force that leads, all, leads us to the life that we have on the planet now and the life that we'll have on the planet in the future. Also, the life that we've had on the planet in the past that we can study through um, DNA and fossils. So the unity in the diversity of life. So a striking unity underlies the diversity of life. So as I said, we have trillions of different organisms on the planet, but there's still some similarities between them. Like I said, the four bases that make up our DNA, we all have similar proteins, right? So for example, DNA is a universal genetic language common to all organisms. So let me just clarify that. Remember that DNA is made of nucleotides. We talked about nucleotides having a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogenous base. That nitrogenous base, A, T, C, or G. Four letters repeated in different sequences make up you. It also makes up the person sitting next to you. If you have a cat, a dog, a hamster, a lizard, a fish, those four letters also made up your pet, right? You go to the zoo and you see giraffes and you see monkeys and you see birds and you see snails and weird hissing cockroaches and things. Every single one of those things is made of the same four letters, the same four nitrogenous bases, right? So we have similarities between organisms that are evident in all levels of biological hierarchy because we have this universal language of DNA, right? And also something that is advantageous, that gives an advantage for survival is going to be passed down. So as evolution occurs, organisms are constantly changing and if they branch off to create different organisms later, still, if something was an advantage, you're going to see that pop up in different populations of different communities of different species throughout all of evolutionary history. Charles Darwin learned him and loved him and the theory of natural selection. So Charles Darwin is considered the father of evolution and specifically evolution through the theory of natural selection. So fossils and other evidence, um, document the evolution of life on Earth over billions of years, because we know that Earth is a lot older than it was originally thought to be. Um, fossils were some of the first pieces of evidence that we used. Now there's a whole bunch of different things that we can use as evidence for evolution, but that helped us to see these structures. Again, structure dictates function. We can compare the structures of ancient organisms to the ones today and see a, um, a link between them for evolutionary purposes. So Charles Darwin published On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection in 1859. Um, and it made two main points in this, in this book that he published. Species showed evidence of descent with modification from common ancestors, and natural selection is the mechanism behind descent with modification. Okay, so natural selection, survival of the fittest. And I don't mean fittest like I like to pick things up and put things down. I mean fitness as in a biological aspect of surviving, having babies, and then they survive. That is the dream for evolution, right? I said that right at the beginning, that if you can survive, you avoid predation, you're surviving, you're having babies, you're contributing to the next gene pool, right? Okay, that means that you have done the evolutionary dream there. So natural selection is survival of the fittest. Only the fit survive. And I don't mean the biggest and the strongest. I mean the ones that are able to survive and have offspring. Okay. And then we go through something called descent with modification. Well, to descend means to come from and to modify means to change. Right? So each generation is going to change a little bit. Okay. Think about an iPhone, right? Descent with modification. We had the first iPhone came out in America in like 2006. I want to say close to that, maybe 2005, somewhere close to there, right? Ancient history to some of you, I know, but I'm old and I understand. That's fine, right? The first iPhone is kind of big, kind of slow. Um, now we have very slim, very fast iPhones and we've, we have a new iPhone every single year. They have some things the same, but do they change a little? Yes, it's the new quote generation of iPhones, right? Animals are the same way, descent with modification. 
you're modifying it, but can you still recognize that it's an iPhone? Yeah, absolutely. Right. These organisms, can you still like recognize that it's kind of the same thing? Yeah. But did it change a little? Yes, absolutely. That's called descent with modification. Okay. Um, so that's how species evolve over time. Um, Darwin's theory captured the duality of unity and diversity, which we've talked about, even though, like I said, they do appear to be opposing forces, they actually work well together. Unity, because we have a lot of the same basic rules, right, like our DNA, and diversity, because there are so many new branches of species being developed all the time through descent with modification. So Darwin observed that individuals in the population vary in their traits, and many of which are um, heritable. So basically, you have to have a population that is diverse, right, which means it has a large variety. So individuals in a population vary in their traits. Hair color, skin color, eye color, all of these things, height, right? Um, more offspring are produced than survive, and competition is inevitable, right? Um, you're always going to have competition over resources, whether it's food, water, shelter, mates, things like that. And species generally suit their environment. This is their, this is part of their fitness, right? That they are suited for their environment, that they are adapted to their environment. If they are fit, they are well suited for their environment. If they are biologically unfit, then they are not well suited to their environment. Um, Darwin inferred that individuals that are best suited for their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. That's called fitness in biology. Okay, I'm not talking about going to the gym and lifting 850 billion pounds. I'm talking about surviving and having babies. That makes you biologically fit. Okay, so over time, more individuals in a population will have the advantageous traits. Because if you're surviving, you're probably doing something right, right? And then if you are mating, that means that you're attracting the attention of a mate, which means, again, you're probably doing something right which means that those traits that you have that are making you able to live and breed are being passed on. Those are advantageous traits in the scheme of biology. So in other words, the environment quote selects <clears throat> natural selection, nature selecting environment, nature, right? The environment selects the propagation of beneficial traits. If it's a benefit, it will be propagated through the next couple generations, right? Darwin called this process natural selection. So he developed the theory of evolution through natural selection. This is a little diagram to say that basically we have, we have a diverse beetle population. The light colored ones are obviously easily seen. Mr. Bird is gonna eat them. And eventually we have the fit ones surviving. Are they stronger? No, they're just better camouflage, which makes them more fit because they're surviving and they're reproducing and having babies, right? That is biologically fit. So the tree of life, um, this is kind of developed from evolution as a whole. So the forelimb of a human, the forelimb of a horse, the flipper of a whale, the wing of a bat, all share common skeletal architecture. Again, structure dictates function, okay? Uh, these structures are all similar. Um, the shared anatomy of these mammalian limbs reflects the inheritance of a limb structure from a common ancestor. If all of our bones look very similar, it's because we came from the same place. A common ancestor in very very long time ago history but still a common ancestor so the diversity of mammalian limbs results from modification we talked about descent with modification right so it results from modification by natural selection over millions of years you're not going to see you know a new organism pop up in your lifetime it takes millions of years for these little tiny tiny descent with modification changes to happen every year right Darwin proposed that natural selection could cause an ancestral species to give rise to two or more descendant species. Makes sense, okay? They branch off and live in different environments, especially. Um, for example, the finches um, of the Galapagos Islands, right? Um, descent from a common ancestor. So finches are birds. They lived on um, the Chilean coast, so like Chile, uh, South America. They lived on the coast there. And a form, uh, formation of islands came about called the Galapagos Islands. And then they got inhabited by all of these Chilean coastline birds, finches. And each one of these islands had a different food source. So over time, over time, over time, these finches developed different characteristics to make them suited for their environment. One initial species, an ancestral species, gave rise to descendant species. Lots of different types of these finches over, again, a long period of time. It's not like, oh, next year we're going to have all these new species. It doesn't work like that, okay? 
Evolutionary relationships are often illustrated with tree-like diagrams to show ancestors and their descendants. Looks like this. Common ancestor was our Chilean coastline bird, our finch, and then all of these different finches came around afterwards. They all look, you know, similar, but there are differences. There's differences in their eyes and their beaks and their size just based on the food sources, right? You can see bud eater, insect eater, all of these different things. These are, this is an example of descent with modification. This is an example of our shared ancestry. And this is how we have diversity. Okay, next concept, uh, biological inquiry entails forming and testing hypotheses based on observations of nature. So the word science is derived from the Latin verb meaning to know. It's great because scientists want to know what's going on, right? Inquiry is a search for um, information and explanations. So the scientific process includes making observations, so things that you can see, right? Forming logical hypotheses, educated guesses, and then testing them through experimentation. So making observations. Biologists describe natural structures and processes. Again, we're studying life. Um, and our recorded observations are called data, right? Um, so these are things that are observable, things that you can see. Um, data fall into two different categories. You have qualitative um, or descriptions rather than measurements. And then you also have quantitative, which is a recorded measurement. It's a numerical value qualitative and quantitative, description versus numbers. Um, then we have two different types of reasoning that we use. Inductive reasoning draws conclusions through the logical process of induction. Um, and our other type is called deductive reasoning. But through induction, generalizations are drawn from a large number of observations. So you see something happening a whole lot. If it's always the same thing, then you're going to induce, like you're going to have that inductive thought, right, that this is going to happen again because you've seen it happen so many times. So for example, all organisms are made of cells was based on two centuries, two centuries, it's a long time of microscopic observations. Okay. Um, in science, you have a hypothesis. It's a rational uh, rationalization, basically, that's accounting for a set of observations. So you see something happening and you make an educated guess. It's based on what your observations are, right? So it's an explanation that is on trial. So you have to test a hypothesis in order to determine if it is supported or not supported by the data that you gather. So a scientific hypothesis leads to predictions that can be tested uh, with additional observations and experimentation. Next is our deductive reasoning. Like I said, it's similar to inductive, but slightly different. So deductive reasoning extrapolates from general premises. Um, to specific predictions. So this is not something that you've observed a whole bunch. This is just like a generalization that you're making essentially. So hypothesis is then tested experimentally. Um, the initial observations may lead to multiple different hypotheses and that's okay because you can test many of them, not always in science, but theoretically you can test many of them. Like for this example, your flashlight doesn't turn on. Interesting. Why doesn't the flashlight work? Hmm. Maybe the batteries are dead or hmm, I wonder if the bulb is burned out or now you can plug in your flashlights. Like there's an internal battery, but you charge it with an outlet. Like maybe I just need to charge the battery instead of replacing the battery. These are all hypotheses and they are all very testable. You test it. If it worked, then that was it. If it didn't work, keep going, right? That's kind of how science works. Um, a hypothesis can never be conclusively proven. This is one of my biggest pet peeves in labs. You cannot say, my experiment proved that. No, it didn't. Your experiment supported that this has happened, right? So you make an educated guess, then you do an experiment, and then in your conclusion statement, you always go back to say, my hypothesis was correct because da da da, my hypothesis was incorrect because blah, 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 right? So a hypothesis can never be conclusively proven to be true because we can never test all of the alternatives. You can say that your hypothesis is supported by the experiment. You can never say proven, right? Um, hypotheses gain credibility by surviving multiple attempts at falsification. So if you're doing all these experiments to try to prove your hypothesis wrong, but it's still right, it's still supported, then like that's a great hypothesis, right? That's how, that's how you know you had a good one. Um, questions that can and cannot be addressed by science. Contrary to popular belief, as hard as it may try, science can't answer everything, especially in this information age that we're living in right now. 
Like the questions are coming so fast and we're trying to develop ways to test them. We just can't answer everything yet. Yet We're going to keep trying because the word science literally comes from the phrase to know. We want to know, right? So a hypothesis must be testable and falsifiable. For example, a, hypo a hypothesis involving supernatural explanations cannot be tested, right? I can't be like, oh, I think that a rainbow is not actually refractions of light. I think that a unicorn flies through the sky. Well, that's something that I can't test because they're not real, right? Um, such, such explanations are outside the bounds of science. And this is kind of alluding to the whole evolution thing where we're talking about divine entities such as gods and deities that religion, you know, says created different life on earth versus evolution. That is a testable thing that we can, we can test and we can create hypotheses and either um, support them or falsify them, right? But we can't say that, you know, anything that a church or a other religious entity says is correct because we can't actually test it. That's not science. That's called religion. It's completely different. Not that it's wrong. It's just a completely different branch of whatever. I'm not going to touch that for my class, right? I'm a scientist. I'm going to teach you what we can know through hypothesis, hypotheses and testable uh, questions, right? Cool, now that we're all happy about that. Experimental controls. If you have a hypothesis, you better do it in an experiment to figure out if you are supporting or rejecting your hypothesis. So a controlled experiment compares an experimental group, um, so non-camouflage mice, for example, with a control group, the camouflage mice. So ideally, um, only the variable of interest, so in this case, the coloration, is going to differ between the control and the experiment. You can't be like, I'm going to compare these two completely different things. You're only testing one variable at a time. That's how you have a good experiment. You're testing one variable. Variable. In this case, the variable is coloration. Okay, camouflage. Whether it is camouflage, so the color is camouflage, or the color of the mouse is not. You're not trying to do like a duck and a mouse. Those are completely two different things. You're trying to keep as many parameters the same as you can. Okay, and then you're going to see a difference um in outcome most likely so a controlled experiment means that control groups are used to cancel the effects of unwanted variables so a controlled experiment does not mean that all unwanted variables are kept constant okay so here we have a control group i like to talk about bacteria because my degree is in microbiology so let's say you have a petri dish and you have that gel agar on there and your teacher tells you to go and swab different things with the Q-tip around your, around your classroom. And then you wipe it on that gel agar stuff and you put the lid back on your Petri dish. And a couple days later, all this weird stuff starts to grow, right? A control in that experiment would be one of the dishes that didn't get a swab wiped on it. Because you're proving that nothing was going to grow. It wasn't in the gel. Whatever you swabbed had the source of the fungus or the bacteria or whatever it is you're trying to grow, right? Okay, so theories and science. In the context of science, a theory is broader in scope than a hypothesis. It is general enough to lead to new test testable hypotheses and supported by a large body of evidence in comparison to a hypothesis. So therefore, the theory of evolution through natural selection is more broad than a hypothesis. It is general enough to be uh, offer up new hypotheses to be tested, right? But it is largely supported. It is largely supported. It's not a law. It's a theory because there are some things that science still can't 100% prove undeniably, right? So that's what we call these theories in science. Now, that doesn't mean that, oh, it's just a theory, like a conspiracy theory. It's just like, you know, people coming up with all kinds of things. In science, a theory is very well supported that it is widely accepted, okay? So don't just be like, oh, it's just a theory that this is gonna work, but you can't use it like you can in like loose conversation. Theories hold a lot of weight in the scientific community. Um, science as a social process, so community and diversity. So scientists work together, collaborate together and build off of past, present and you know, future scientists will do the same thing of all the collaborations and all the findings and everything of other scientists. So anyone who becomes a scientist benefits from the rich storehouse of discoveries by others who have come before them. If they've already tested an experiment, you can use that work to then keep working on yours. Um, 
most scientists work in teams because you have more ideas, you can test things, you can delegate tasks, you can delegate testing of hypotheses, you can work together to develop good experiments. Um, science is uh, rarely perf uh, perfectly objective, but is continuously evaluated through expectation um, that observations and experiments are repeatable and hypotheses are falsifiable. So in order to have a good experiment, it needs to be repeatable and it needs to have similar results like very similar results in order to be considered a good experiment. And that's why all these journals and everything have very difficult, um, you know, uh, rules to get published in them because you have to make sure that your experiments are repeatable and your hypotheses are falsifiable because then you know that you have a good work, um, a good piece of work in front of you that what they're claiming is probably pretty correct. It's not just, you know, random studies that the media throws at you because they can. The relationship between science and society is clearer when technology is considered. The goal of technology is to apply scientific knowledge for some um, specific purpose, and science and te technology are interdependent. Um, you'll see that as we go in the future, science is going to rely more on technology because as we know more and more and more, we want to make sure that the things that we are testing are as accurate as possible. So instead of human error, we have you know, technology can measure things for us. Um, we have different machines that can test things that, you know, your human eyes cannot, right? So these two things depend on each other very strongly, right? They're part of the STEM or the STEAM programs that most of your high schools, universities, colleges, et cetera. They go together quite well. Okay, we've reached the end here. So yay, welcome to biology. That was our little introduction. Thank you for listening to me. I hope that you're excited about biology because it is the best of the sciences right? Um, we're studying life. And why do you care about that? You're alive. Hello, you're sitting here listening to this. You're alive. Everything that we learn is somehow related to you because you are a product of evolution and evolution is the overarching theme of biology. So I hope you're excited for the next one. Y'all have a great day.